and the Nasdaq are all trending higher. Nasdaq is up almost half a percentage point right now, 2299. Dow Industrials and the S&P both up about a third of a percent. The Dow up 40 points right now at 10,694. Well, as we said, a sex scandal is causing a shakeup over at Hewlett Packard. President, Chairman, and CEO Mark Hurd is out after the company found he had a secret relationship with a contractor who was paid for non-business related services. And that woman has a colorful past, one could say. She's done everything from real estate to reality shows to R-rated movies. Let's go over to HP's headquarters in Palo Alto, California. Our Chris Valerio has the latest. And Chris, you know, it's not so much what we do know about this. It, there's still a lot that we don't necessarily know. Yeah. It definitely is, especially considering how HP came forward, really put this out there. The lack of details is really astounding. Um, yeah, we don't know exactly what the nature of the relationship is. We know that she put a press release out through her lawyer saying that there was no uh, intimate contact between the two. You know, the bottom line, though, is the reason the stock is falling so much is because there's a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen. In fact, today there's a webcast going on, perhaps right now within the company, uh, where the new interim CEO, Kathy Lesjack, the also, the CFO is addressing employees, and look, she has been come out. She has come out and really been on the front face of this scandal. She has spoken twice in the last three days, uh, talking to employees today. She said that she was going to um, answer any questions that they might have. One thing that she's definitely going to be doing is really downplaying Herd's role in the turnaround that the company has seen, and perhaps building up the role of the 300,000 employees that are here. A really large, large company here in the valley. And, of course, as we all know, this isn't Hewlett-Packard's first brush with scandal, although it is the first of this kind. But, I mean, Mark Hurd was supposed to be sort of the straight arrow that was turning the company around. Mm -hmm. He was. And you know what? Here's the other bottom line, and that is that HP is considered the patriarch of Silicon Valley. It's been here for decades, uh, really has been trying to reestablish its image, both as a company culture and also within the culture of Silicon Valley. Uh, Mark Hurd came out, really embodied that culture. The management style, what HP is very well known for, is a very people-centric management model. Mark Hurd really embodying that, taking uh, control. Really, a lot of people obviously crediting him for the success, the turnaround that HP HP has seen over the last few years, and this is what's really going to be key going forward in not only the choosing of who is going to follow in his footsteps, but also in, Ka also in Kathy Lesjack's uh, words that she not only speaks to employees, but also over these next few days, and what the image that she is giving and how HP can do, given that lack of leadership at the helm. All right, Chris Valerio, obviously they're in front of HP headquarters out on the West Coast. Thanks. Well, BP's bill for the Gulf oil spill keeps growing higher. The total price tag so far, $6 billion. Lizzie O'Leary is in the Gulf today. She joins us now from Bayou Battery, Alabama, with more on the costly cleanup. Lizzie, good afternoon. Hey, Mark. Well, the costly cleanup is something that, of course, people here are watching because it has been, frankly, the main source of employment down here. We know that bill topped six billion dollars for BP. They told us that they also made that first installment into the escrow fund, some three billion there. It will be 20 over the course of several years. And a little news that we broke uh, last week: Chase will be the main. I'm sorry, City will be the main bank handling this, along with a Gulf partner bank as well. So that's what they're doing on the money side, and a lot of people are following that very closely down here as the cleanup operation starts to ramp down, uh, the claims operation may ramp up. Ken Feinberg is taking over in the next few days. He's in the Gulf talking to people here uh, about the claims they're filing. Frankly, as people start to lose paychecks doing cleanup here, they're looking to uh, file more claims if they still can't fish. Lizzie, how long do officials expect it'll take to intercept the well? Well, that's the next step here. We know that the cement plug is holding. BP ran a series of tests. They said yesterday they feel confident about those. So it's cemented from the top. They think that they'll be able to intercept and start cementing from the bottom perhaps this weekend, uh, the end of this week. And they're only about 30 or 40 feet away, but this is a very painstaking process. Essentially, they drill a little bit, and then they put an electromagnetic probe down there, get a sense of how close they are to the well. Remember, they're trying to hit a 7-inch target. Once they do that, they try to mud and cement this thing from the bottom, and then there will be a final chapter 
uh, to this drama that's gone on for about three months now, guys. Bloomberg's Lizzie O'Leary in Bayou La Batri, Alabama, with more on that costly cleanup for BP and that Gulf of Mexico oil spill. Lizzie, thanks. Julie? Well, we and many traders are looking ahead to tomorrow. It's the Federal Reserve's Policymaking Committee meeting, and two-year Treasury yields are near a record low as traders debate the possibility of more easing, possibly, by the central bank. Let's go to Dominic Chu and Adam Johnson at our markets desk. Guys, you know, what's the possibility, what's the word here, that there could be some kind of Fed action tomorrow? Uh, not particularly high. Listen to Ethan Harris, the head economist over at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Most likely they will tweak their language and admit that the economy is weaker than they expected. I think that's almost certain to happen. I don't think, however, they will promise any policy changes. I think it's a little early for that. No policy change. In other words, they're going to tweak what they say. They're going to let you know this whole thing's taking a lot longer, Dom. Yeah, here's the thing, though. I mean, take a look at those Treasury yields. Like, you know, Julie, like you said, on the two-year side of things, you're going to see that thing at, at pretty much record lows right now at this stage now. And a lot of traders out there aren't even looking for any kind of a, any kind of a rise anytime soon here. So that's, that's the real issue here, guys. So people are also looking, of course, much further out and ta possibly talking about a Fed rate hike. But, you know, they're not talking about it happening anytime remotely soon, right? No, no, we ran the numbers. Look at the Fed fund futures. I mean, what is it, Tom? It's pretty much, what, 60% chance of pretty much no action right now. But you go out a year, a year out there, it's pretty much a one in four shot of them doing any kind of a rate rise, whether it be 25, 50 basis points, anything of the sort. So no traders out there are saying anything about any kind of a rate rise anytime soon. And Adam, that's pretty much going to be indicative for things for quite some time to come. Oh, yeah, very much so. And, you know, there there is a precedent, Jules. If, if you look at the chart over the past uh, several years, there is a precedent that rates as low as they seem now, they could go even lower. Uh, the 10-year right now is at about 282, 2.82%. Imagine, imagine, Dom, actually loaning your money for 2.82%. Well, look, look at the chart here. I mean, yep. in a downtrend right now. This is just in the past six months, though. If you look about three the to five, five years. years out, I mean, obviously, we're not in panic mode now, but we saw 2% yields on 10-year treasuries. And on there it is. 2%. That was, the granted, that was last December when you had maximum angst. But the point is, Julie, there is a precedent for a 2% rate yeah. on the 10-year. However much angst there was at that moment, hey, the guys, precedent exists. Guys, could I ask a question? It, it seems like even though we have higher prices on these notes, buyers aren't scared off. No, they, because where else are you going to go? I mean, if you're really concerned about a slowdown, it's a slowdown that also affect companies' ability to produce earnings. So then you're looking for a safe haven like the IBM deal, the three-year paper at 1% interest rate from IBM. In other words, here, IBM, take my money. Just pay me a percent, and I'll take it back in three well, years. Here, Maybe we're out the by thing then. Too. Here's the thing, too. I mean, this, this flight to safety trade really is still on here, guys, right? The idea is if you don't have any place else to put the money, you want to put it someplace where you know so you're going to get the money back. And right now, just looking at things, there are a lot of excess reserves. We talk about corporate balance balance sheet cash, right. banks have excess reserves at about a, at about a trillion dollars. All right, now look just take a look guy. at this chart. Look at this thing. It's 20 years. You can see it for 20 years. We could go back 30, 40, 50 years. The chart would look the same. Not really a lot of excess reserves. The last two years, a trillion dollars worth on bank balance sheets. Right. Well, now. and speaking of excess reserves, guys, uh, that's related to one of the things remaining that the Fed might be able to potentially do. Well, yeah, there are there are a couple of bullets uh, left in the holster. Uh Number one. Oh, I mean, the MBS program, right? I mean, trying to kind of get back. They, they said they were going to maybe not reinvest those proceeds. Now they are. That's $1.25 trillion that they could reinvest in the mortgage-backed securities. You could allow inflation to go to 4% before you do anything. Define that as an acceptable limit. And uh, tax Dom, excess reserves. Woo. Now, that's a, that's a huge, big bullet. I, you know, do you really want to go there? Not a lot of traders think it's going to happen anytime soon, guys. Right. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Well, as traders await tomorrow's Fed meeting, we are seeing the buying pick up. Let's get the details from Laura Lee. She's on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Hi, Laura. Hi there, Mark. Well, you know, stocks are hovering right around the highs of the session, but I do want to point out, not seeing a whole lot of volume today. Also, stocks uh, kind of in a tight range as traders kind of await to hear uh, what comes out of the Federal Reserve tomorrow. But there is some speculation that the Fed may announce 
uh, some further stimulus measures to get the economy going, and that's helping to support uh, stocks right now. But interesting to note, though, really uh, doing the heavy lifting in terms of the Dow's gains. We're seeing a lot of buying in IBM shares. Cisco also moving higher. Uh, this, of course, as HP shares really take a free fall here uh, following that sh management shakeup. Now, analysts over at Jefferies also say that Cisco may come out and report better than expected earnings uh, later this week. So we are seeing some buying ahead of that. So overall, uh, not a bad day here, posting just modest gains. Back over to you. All right, Laura Lee of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks. Will the Fed take action to try and stimulate the economy and create new jobs? Probably not, according to Tom and Adam in the market. But coming up, we'll have a preview of tomorrow's meeting of the Fed's Open Market Committee and a look at what the options are and what the Fed might do, if not uh, take some sort of policy action. And also, we'll be talking Goldman's trading trouble next. Around the clock, around the world, Bloomberg keeps you connected on television, online, on the radio, and on mobile. If anyone depends on you, listen to this important message. Three out of four Americans know they need life insurance, and many who have it know they don't have enough. Sound like you? How would your family get by without you? Would they lose their home or their dreams of a good education? They don't have to. You can guarantee those you love $200,000, $500,000, $750,000 or more with life insurance through Matrix Direct. We'll help you get more for your money, up to 75% more. Just look. Less than $14 a month buys a 40-year-old man a $250,000 term life policy. That's up to three times what you can get from other companies for the same price. No wonder millions of Americans have already contacted Matrix Direct. The call is free, the quote is free, and there's no obligation. Make the future more secure for those you love. Call now so you can sleep better at night. For free information, call 800-482-1348 or visit MatrixDirect.com. That's 800-482-1348 or MatrixDirect.com. Corporate America, taking the problem of rising health care costs into its own hands. We have found that the sticks actually work pretty darn well. What companies are doing to shape up their workforce and your wallet. Working it out. Our series begins Tuesday at 4.30 p.m. on StreetSmart. Don't be just a trader. Be a speed trader. Get direct access to over 35 market centers. Trade unlimited shares, including OTC bulletin board and pink sheets. Sign up for a free trial today. Speedtrader.com. Pants, pants, pants. I am folding the pants. Do they go on my head? Everyday moments can become teaching moments because learning starts long before school does. Give your child the start they need at bornlearning.org. You're watching Bloomberg News. I'm Julie Hyman. And let's get you up to date on our top news now. We begin with breaking news. The Goldman Sachs bond trader Fabrice Tor held preliminary settlement talks with the Securities and Exchange Commission. That all according to a government lawyer. Tor was the only individual named in the SEC's fraud complaint against Goldman Sachs, which accused the firm of misleading investors about investments linked to subprime mortgages. Goldman reached a $550 million settlement with the SEC last month. That is the largest penalty ever against a Wall Street firm, but the case against Tor is still ongoing. Billionaire investor Carl Icahn bet almost a billion dollars on energy stocks during the BP oil disaster. That move helped his hedge funds gain 8% in July. Icahn Enterprises has disclosed the investment in a quarterly SEC filing. Icahn did not say which energy stocks he bought. And actress Mia Farrow testified today that Naomi Campbell told her she received a huge diamond from former Liberian President Charles Taylor. That contradicts testimony the supermodel gave last week in Taylor's war crimes trial. Campbell said she had gotten some, quote, dirty-looking stones after she went to a dinner with Taylor. 